Um, I'm, I'm going to keep it quite uh, easy on, on, on the brain. <laughs> Otherwise, you, you guys may just end up being um, a bit more postprandial. So, um, my name is Numish. I'm an orthopedic consultant based at uh, Salford Royal in Manchester. And uh, the remit I was given was, was to talk about biologics, but from a sort of a, a negative perspective. So, my uh, talk is a little bit skewed that way, but I have to admit I use biologics, so um, yeah, I, I'm a bit uh, cross purposes here. So, uh, thank you, Adil, for giving a really nice overview of what biologics are. But um, the way I understand it, they're a medicinal product that we're manipulating to harness some of their properties so that we can induce healing or regeneration or thereabouts. Um, and they, can, they contain various uh, things within them. Uh, whereas, by contrast, any drugs that we give or administer are chemically synthesized or they're so adapted from their natural source that they're no longer representative of where they were derived from. So that's the main difference between biologics and drugs or medications for us. Uh, this is just a quick overview showing you how uh, your different biological therapies work because they come under, th this is a, a, an umbrella term to suggest how we can manipulate the biology of our own self to the healing process. Uh, and this is one of the PRP syringes that we use at work as well uh, in my hospital. So the spectral biologics is significant. Um, there is the autologous chondrocyte implantation. Has anybody heard of that at all? Shortened for AC, yeah? I'm sure the consultants have and they probably would have used it as well. Um, so, so that's basically where you have your um, uh, own cartilage plugs that you actually use um, and, you, and you harvest them and then you're able to implant them back into a defect within the cartilage uh, that can be usually done in the knee. Uh, the other one to it is called a Macy where you have uh, a membrane where you can impregnate your, your cartilage cells that you've harvested and then use that as a patch to stick on uh, to the actual defect within the knee itself. Um, you've heard about PRP, platelet-rich plasma, bone marrow aspirate you've heard of. Osteochondral graft uh, can either be where we, I showed you in the last picture here, where you can actually go into the non-weight-bearing parts of the knee and pour out a plug, essentially of cartilage and a bit of subchondral bone, and then plug that into the defect itself and make a bit of a mosaic within usually the knee again. Um, and then there's the, t the cells that we can get out from the fat cells um, and there are various others. What I found really interesting as well, I was looking into this, is I never realized that there, there's, you can actually use amniotic fluid or membrane as well uh, because they've got regenerative properties in there as well. Um, I just find that a little bit weird, but it's, it, it is being marketed. So, and then you've got juvenile cartilage implant as well um, that's, that's harvested. Uh, this is just a quick show just to show you how uh, the um, AC or MACI essentially works. So you, you go and do an arthroscopy, you go into the knee, you take a, a biopsy of your, of your healthy cartilage, that's your lesion there that hurts a lot for the patient. And then basically what you do is, once you've had the um, cartilage cells to the laboratory, you'll, be, you'll grow them within the laboratory, you'll come back for your second surgery, and you'll identify that area again, um, and you'll clean it and debride it and then you'll inject your chondrocytes and then you can patch it up um, with, with either a collagen graft or whatever you, you like to use. So, and, and that's actually been shown to have some fairly good and robust results. Um, just a quick idea on the evidence, because you've got to understand that a, a lot of these therapies exist, but where's the evidence for all of these? And that's what we've got to be very, very careful of as clinicians or practitioners, that we're not just... Um, building up whatever the companies tell us to build up, but we've got to make sure our decisions are based firmly within the, the, the research uh, and also evidence as well. Evidence-based medicine is what we like to practice. So what's interesting, I'll just focus here. So AC, PRP, and MAC, level one evidence, two, three, four, and uh, th these are the different levels of evidence, one being the highest, obviously. Only these top three have got level one evidence. Okay, so that's for the AC, MACI, and the PRP. OATS has, has also a study as well. So you can see it's really sparse on really good evidence. It's skewed towards just these three or four therapies. All the rest of these 
where it's a life again we saw as well on one of the uh, stalls today and uh, the amniotic fluid stuff and all of that they're all got very they all got zeros if you look here there's very little evidence that they've got so it's all going to be anecdotal or what the company have produced within the laboratory or they say that these cells are really great to use so always say use whatever the company say to you with a pinch of salt and take with a pinch of salt so don't just uh, think that this is the, you know it's going to be the the honest truth always so just always be a bit skeptical about new new therapies that are coming onto the market and i think that's a good way to be to be skeptical and then to be brought on board once your skepticism uh you know has been dealt with so what are the good things? So we're, we're using PRP in my institution as part of a trial. We do three injections every two weeks. Uh, we've got clear criteria of which type of patients we'll inject this into. Um, you know, they'll be non-degenerative, as in the, they get knee pain. We do an x-ray, there's nothing there. MRI doesn't show anything. We're a bit lost with these people about what to do. We'll do some physio. That will help, but they're still not happy. Because you've got to remember, our patients are, have got very high expectations nowadays. So we're going to sort of try and address those. And an injection sort of goes psychologically to them that, oh, this might work. So we do sort of try that. So that placebo effect I'll, I'll come on to as well. Um, but So we use it for that type of pain. We use it for trochanteric bursa pain, um, non-degenerative hip pain, um, Achilles tendinopathy, tennis elbow, that type of thing. Because obviously you don't want to be injecting into an Achilles tendon because of the risk of rupture. So this does give us a little bit of more uh, armamentarium of how to deal with it. So the mode of action, um, I think uh, Adil already mentioned, which was you've got mature cells, which you're harvesting, you spin them down, and you basically have got a, uh, a super amount of platelets within, within that area. So what you've got to think, these cells are normally not that concentrated in one little part of your body. They spread out your whole body. So is that really a good thing that we're, you know, this literally taking these off, siphoning them off, off, and then concentrating them in abnormal, supra-physiological concentration within the knee. Do, you, do we think that's going to be a good idea or a bad idea? The thing is, we don't know, all right? But the evidence is there that they are efficacious and they are helping to an extent. So, this, so that's what happens to so inject directly into where, where, where it's needed. Okay, uh, the advantages we are told are biological, there's minimum risk. The disadvantages are, um, you know, there is a cost involved, obviously, depending on what system you use, how much blood volume you take. We were using one system that we had to harvest 60 mils from the patient, and that's big, big syringes, okay, 60 mils. And you've got these li this little old deer that, doesn't <laughs> that can't afford to lose too much blood, and you're siphoning off 60 mils. So we moved on to a different system, which is 15 mils, which is still a volume of blood, but slightly less. So, the other thing that I use in my practice is the bone marrow aspirate concentration. So, um, I use this for femoral head AVN lesions that I do core, core decompressions on. Um, and we also use it because we've got a really large recon unit from Manchester. We use it for our non-unions as, as well in the long bone fractures. Uh, and we're finding really good results with those actually. Um, and the mode of action, again, is mesenchymal stem cells that we use. But again, you've got to think about things. You, you, you're harvesting these MSCs from wh whichever part of the body. You're hoping that as soon as you inject them into that part of the non-union or that part into the femoral head, those cells are suddenly going to know what to do. Okay? Have they got the correct chemical environment to react in that way? There's a whole cascade of growth hormone and chemicals and cytokines which we don't understand. We're just hoping for the best, okay? Now the results are again encouraging in my practice, so, but I cannot say that this is robust evidence. This is anecdotal at best. Um, and it's only by doing more studies and level one studies that we can hopefully answer that question. So again, take things with a pinch of salt, but as long as this, I feel if the science is valid and it makes sense to you, and it's something that's safe and is intuitive in your practice, then I don't think there's any harm in utilizing those things, be that in the framework of a trial or a study. Um, again, uh, advantages of using bone marrow aspirate is you've got bio it's biological, there's minimal risk. Uh, again, it's very costly, it's about 800 pounds or something to do a BMAC. 
Um, it, it's invasive because I normally harvest it from the Iliac Crest, which I feel is probably one of the best places to get the MSCs from. And the other thing is because when you harvest it, it becomes a liquid when you put it in the centrifuge. So how do you actually contain it around the area that you're injecting it in? So that's always a challenge as well. So I have to use some sort of putty or a bit of cement or something to just plug the hole into. Uh, some people inject it onto a matrix, like a collagen graft matrix, which is like a bit of foam. It looks like a bit of foam. And you wrap that around a non-union or whatever. Okay. So um, th this is just one of the centrifuges. It's actually literally a desktop tower that's about yay big. And it sits on top of a trolley, and I can use, and it doesn't take a lot of room, and I can do my surgery and then hand the, my sample out, and it gets injected inside, and it spins down, and I can just get that little buffy layer there, just about there, is where all the MSCs are, are, are sitting, because of their weight on the, on the centrifuge. Okay. So, what's the, sorry. So what are the bad things? The evidence is obviously still very lacking. Um, you know, th there have been some papers on this already where there is, th they found some strong evidence that PRP does not improve uh, plantar fasciitis and, 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 and other therapies that are, have got limited efficacy in that. Um, another paper found that there was insufficient evidence to support the use of uh, these therapies for treating muscular skeletal soft tissue injuries. So I think that there is a, a body of evidence that says there is good evidence to say that these can be very effective, but there are other evidence that says that actually they're not any better than using uh, you know, placebo or any other uh, type of modality. Okay. Um, but you know, th there is light at the end of the tunnel for us. So when you, when you do have a look at it, the uh, Vosital uh, talked about uh, therapy, uh, tendinopathy, sorry. And they said that there were three quality studies and two low quality studies. Um, again, that showed no significant benefit at the final follow-up um, compared with the control group. But the, the good thing is that we are now starting to see more and more of these studies. And it's only once you do, when you have a lot of these studies that you can do like meta-analysis or systematic review um, and sort of amalgamate the raw data and then see how that matches up to actually having a significant, um, showing a, a, any significance or not. Um, again, this is just a PRP vial which shows you, you know, so we, we're hoping that the platelets are all sort of sitting there for us to siphon off. Uh, but again, we're not testing them in the laboratory. We're not finding out that this is exactly where the platelets are. Um, it is a little bit of mixed science going on as well. So what's the ugly bit, okay? So I've already touched a bit on the cost already. So some of these therapies are very expensive. Can we really put the burden of this cost on our patients? Uh, well, the NHS pays for itself, but it's taxpayers' money, and we've got a responsibility to use our resources effectively. Um, cost still remains quite high. Um, the companies are, have gone all out in aggressively marketing this. Um, and some people have come out as, and said, you know, where people expect that injected medicines will be more powerful, and I can speak uh, from experience as well, where some patients prefer to have an injection rather than having a tablet. They'll say, no doc, uh, you know, I'll get a Yorkshireman and say to her, I don't want to use any tablets, uh, but yeah, I'm happy to be injected at any time. So it's, there, there is a really strong placebo effect here. Um, and they also were influenced by what elite athletes are doing, you know? So if it's good for some of these footballers to have done, then it's good enough for me and I'll go for it. But they don't understand the reality of when you're looking after elite sports people, they have a, a, a set time of performance or their lifespan as an athlete is set. They want to do the best they can do and the most they can do. So for example, Man City, Aguero, he he's been suffering from knee pain for many years. And it just came, because he was surviving with just having steroid injection after steroid injection, like around games and the physios would do that for him. Uh, but you just got to imagine that, you know, his knee's going to get knackered sooner or later. And then he just put it off and then he had some surgery done um, in Barcelona and then he came back and he was sort of getting back to his, his, his normal routine. But you can see that they will try anything, you know, and he's a young bloke, you know, he's had steroid, multiple steroid injections, he had surgery just to keep himself going. That's what the general public don't understand. That these athletes will do anything 
to keep on playing. And they will try PRP, they will try bone marrow aspirate, they will try whatever the next therapy is because they just want to keep going. And suddenly we as members of the public think that, oh, if they're doing it, it's got to be great and it gives longevity because look at them, these like scoring like so many goals every season. But that's what we've got to be careful and we've got to temper that expectation of our patients as clinicians and, and healthcare professionals that that's not actually the how we want to be managing you because we're looking at things in the you know 10 20 years down the line very often i'll speak to my patients if i'm doing any arthroplasty procedure i'm you're going to be my patient for the next 20 30 years and i'm not going to do anything to you that i'm not going to be happy and be able to look you in the eye and you know in 20 30 years time and say actually maybe i shouldn't have done that so we've just got to be careful especially about the aggressive marketing that goes on as well and sort of contain ourselves a little bit um, and one other thing that you've got to remember about biologics is suddenly when you say biologics, it's like it's not a dirty word. People think it's high tech and it's natural. And if you can combine the, the, these two words, suddenly it's a fantastic panacea, you know, but it isn't. And that's why when, when these two terms are used, it's usually very contradictory. But when it comes to biologics, biologics has both. So again, the psychology comes into it. One has to be very, very careful. And this is a little bit about MSC. So what, what I what I like to know is how people can say that these will suddenly differentiate into these, you know, uh, you know, cartilage or chondrocytes or whatever is what we're trying to do or, or bone. And how will they actually differentiate if we haven't created that environment that they would normally do that? So so that that's my question. Uh, there's just a few references that, that people can take a note of. Okay, that brings me to an end. Any questions? Yeah. Obviously, you mentioned the cost of that. And so, mm -hmm. the procedure. Do you do you generally use them on all your surgeries, or is there a category or certain people you offer? Yeah, yeah. There's, so we've got a very strict uh, indication criteria. So if you don't fit that criteria, you're not going to get it. So you you've got to ration it, obviously, in the NHS. But in the you know where, where you've got fee paying you know patients, they'll be like I read this in the newspaper or the Daily Mail it's great, uh, I want it. So then again, it's the same process. You've got to counsel them, you've got to explain to them the, the risk benefit analysis and explain that it's still gonna cost X amount. Um, I think I'm not too wary about biologics because at the moment, there's no significant adverse outcomes or uh, things that we're seeing, but is that just you know tip of the iceberg? Are we not just, maybe it's gonna happen, but it'll happen later, I don't know. So you still got to be careful about who you do it. It's, you can't just inject everybody.